everyone. Welcome to COVID and the Classroom, an in-depth look at what is truly an unprecedented back-to-school season. I'm Angie Seth. As the pandemic hit in March, classes across the country were abruptly canceled. Now schools are beginning their cautious steps forward into the new normal, and there are mixed feelings about it right across the board. I don't think there's enough research on kids yet. I really want him to get a proper education that I know I, I don't think I can give him that with the online learning at home. I miss having free days, but it's okay. Like, I have, at least I'll be able to see my friends again. I'm not really worried. Whatever happens, happens. We're going to give it a try, uh, prepare them as much as possible. And, you know, if things change dramatically, if cases go up um, and we feel uncomfortable about it, or if they're really not doing well in the environment, um, we'll be ready to bring them back. Well, over the next hour, we're going to hear more from educators and students about the return to class. We'll talk to a psychologist about preschool anxieties running high for many parents right now. And we'll also take a closer look at the unique back-to-school challenges faced by Indigenous communities. First, let's take a look at a big question for a lot of parents. How to prepare yourself and your kids for the classroom? And, of course, to answer that, let's bring in CDV's infectious disease specialist, Dr. Abdu Cherkawi. Dr. Cherkawi, great to have you. Nice to see you, Angie. Let's kind of start right off the board here as we've been, you know, tracking numbers here. We've been seeing cases in schools in some provinces now. I first want to get your take on that and, and what your message is there. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I think it's understandable that we're going to start seeing uh, trickling in of cases as more uh, communal environments are reestablished and schools are certainly front and foremost when it comes to that. Uh, I don't think we want to get too far ahead of ourselves and we need to recognize that if outbreaks are uh, understood and uh, identified early, we can prevent uh, small brush fires from becoming bigger problems and uh, reintroducing COVID-19 into our community. So I think we all just want to take a deep breath here and understand that as long as we continue to keep community transmission at a low level, we should be okay. So. You heard from uh, some parents uh, speaking there, uh, you know, expressing their concerns as a parent yourself as well. What's your message to uh, Canadian parents out there? Uh, I feel it. I understand the sense of anxiety, the apprehension, the uncertainty, uh, very much so. And I think that uh, how I'm preparing myself and my family is just to make sure that we communicate with each other as much as possible, uh, to validate each other's anxieties, uh, what we're worried about, what the unknowns are, and more than anything, just to model good coping mechanisms, uh, to model good behavior for one another. So that means that we're, we're very big on the idea of making sure we're conscious and aware of hand hygiene and masking and distancing mm -hmm. in all circumstances and making it something that's healthy and positive rather than something that is out of fear or out of a sense of concern that there's something out there lingering that's out to get us. And I think that's an important thing to bear in mind, to make this a moment of empowerment mm. uh, as a family unit rather than something else. And, and having that honest conversation, you mentioned that communication, that conversation, but having those honest conversations with your children, uh, that's really critical, both for kids and parents, but for kids especially, so that, you know, they really understand what's going on, but then they feel comfortable to talk to you about it. Oh, absolutely. And make no mistake about it. I think kids are going through a lot. They've been missing their friends. They've been missing the organic routine of learning now for several months. And now they're going back to a situation that's going to seem foreign and unusual mm -hmm. with staggering of entrances and cohorts and masks everywhere. And I think that we need to prepare them for that. We need to understand what their anxieties are around that. And we need to focus on the fact that if we do things the right way and frame things with a positive message to make masks fun and cool and to remember that we've learned and adapted so well up to this point in time. We'll give kids an opportunity to get a head start on the school year, again, with a sense of empowerment and with a sense of confidence rather than one of fear. For yeah, and having those conversations, as you mentioned, is so important. I know that you've got three beautiful boys, two of which are going to be going back to school. Um, you've been having great uh, in-depth conversations with them about masks and ensuring that they know exactly what they need to do to properly wear them. 
the best way I think we can describe this is to have two of your boys come into the shot here. Um, yeah, I want to right. introduce them right. to our viewers, of course. Uh, and we know that you've been also talking to them about, you know, sanitizing their hands, making sure that uh, that they're keeping their hands clean. So right now we're looking at, we've got nine-year-old Sufyan, and right behind there, wearing that mask right now, is seven-year-old Amin. Boys, it's so good to see you. Hi. So. So, Sufyan, can you, your, I see your brother there is wearing his mask. Can you show us what has dad, mom and dad taught you in terms of keeping yourself nice and that proper hand hygiene and what, how you put on a mask? So, you put the hand sanitizer and just rub it on. It's rubbing right. it really good. That's good. Okay. Very good. And where's your mask? And so uh, then uh, it's in the slip right? And then you just open it up like this. And then you pull it out by the string. You pull it out by the string. Mm -hmm. And then just grab the two strings. Yes. Yeah. And then you put it on. And, we and then you grab these two edges and pull it up so that it covers the... And then it covers the... And that's perfect because it's right underneath your chin. You've got it all nicely covered. And what if I need to take my mask off, Sophia? And what do I need to do then? Uh, then you wash your hands again. Okay, so I re-sanitize my hands. Yeah. Or wash it. Or wash your hands with hand water and soap. Yes. And then, right. And then, and then you grab a the string like this, and then just pull it off, and then like switch your hands like this. To those two edges like this, and you just pull it back. Okay. And then you fold it down like this, and then you put it back. And you put it back in the bag so it stays nice and safe, and it's not there's there's no contamination anywhere. You know, I think you showing us how you've put on the mask there uh, is giving me a great sense of comfort. I think it's going to give a lot of the kids a great sense of comfort. But with you and your brother going back to school, what do you want to tell other kids across Canada for them going back to school? What's your message to them, Sufyan? Uh, that masks are important because uh, they help prevent coronavirus. They protect you from coronavirus. And Amin, I know you're back there and you're wearing your mask. Why don't you come forward? I know there's something you want to tell Canadian kids. What would you like to tell them about the mask? It's really easy to wear a mask. And it's not hard to cough and breathe wearing a mask. Right. And how does it protect you from COVID-19? You were showing that to me earlier in terms of how it prevents COVID-19 from going into your mouth. So if the if the so like if you're outside and the wind is blowing very hard, then if another person has coronavirus or inside. Yeah, or inside. If another person has coronavirus and the coronavirus blows into you, it like into your mouth, then then you'll get coronavirus. Right. But if but if you're wearing a mask it'll just bump into the mask and then fly away. And it protects you, simple as that. And you boys have really illustrated that so beautifully. I want to thank all three of you. You have been great starting off our coverage today. Dr. Abdu Cherkawi, of course, it's always wonderful chatting with you. Your sons are wonderful. We wish them well on their first day of school. Sophia and Amin, thank you both very much. You stay safe and enjoy your school year. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> They're wonderful. Well, despite assurances from school boards and political leaders, there's still a lot of unknowns for families, and that's causing a lot of anxiety for kids and parents alike. I'm not going to be bringing in Dr. Tina Montreal. She is the witch of the conversation. She's a child and adolescent psychologist. Great to, uh, to bring you into this conversation. So the start of school is always anxious for parents and kids. Speaking from my own experience, we're all feeling it with, uh, with my kids. Walk us through what kids might be feeling during a pandemic. Well, yes. So I think your guest summarized, the uh, previous guest summarized a, a lot of these points. I think one of the things not to assume is to not assume that all of our children are equally going to be uh, sensing or feeling uh, anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things is that, you know, with the beginning of school, it's novelty. Um, even though we've been in school in the previous year, it's a new teacher, new maybe new classmates. So I think the important thing is to just pay attention to any changes in our children. For some children, it might be that they withdraw more. 
Uh, they're not as external, as open, as, as, as bubbly as they usually are. And for other kids, it could be the opposite. It's, it could be that they're becoming more irritable, more frustrated. Maybe all of a sudden there's symptoms, bodily symptoms, like, you know, sort of like stomach aches or mm -hmm. other headaches, for example, that could be signs that they're sensing or experiencing some anxiety. One thing I have noticed, and I know with, with, with my two kids during all of this, uh, during the pandemic, was um, waking up in the middle of the night and sort of needing that comfort. So what's your advice to parents when they're trying to help their kids feel comfortable? Yes. So I think one of the things is that when our children seem to be anxious, it does create a sense of instability and, and anxiety in us. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, one of the first things I've been saying in helping our children is first helping ourselves. Mm. Um, so it's really like, you know, the putting on the figurative, putting on our mask first. So making sure that, you know, when our children wake up, for example, like the, uh, what you just mentioned, to just stay calm, just say, you know what, like this is, it's, it's new, it's novel, uh, you know, they're experiencing all sorts of things that are, that are unknown to them to this point. Mm -hmm. And to really reassure them, to really give them, be supportive, uh, listen to them, uh, nurture them back to sleep as we were, we would normally outside of COVID mm -hmm. and uh, just try to stay calm ourselves. What about older kids, kids mm -hmm. going into high school, some potentially, you know, or, or, or getting close to going, going into university, the teenagers that are going to be heading into high school and having to sort of navigate between uh, in school and online learning. How do we work, uh, help them deal with their feelings and concerns? Yeah, I think the first thing is that when we are anxious ourselves, mm -hmm. we have a tendency to overspeak, to reassure. I think one of the things our teenagers need right now is really a listening ear, someone mm -hmm. to really validate how they're feeling, uh, maybe ask prompt, open-ended questions, uh, not questions that are suggestive, but really questions that uh, will elicit a response of how they're truly feeling. And as your previous guest was saying, really try to offer solutions and mm -hmm. really include them as part of this solution plan to help them get back to a certain level of normalcy and control over their anxiety. Yeah, reiterating that we're in this together and we can all work well and support each other in this. Dr. Tina Montrell, great to have you uh, added to the conversation. Dr. Montrell is an adolescent psychologist. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Still to come, while well, teachers are learning on the job how to adapt. It kind of feels like my first year teaching, even though I've been doing this a long time. When we come back, we'll check in with a few teachers as they wade into unknown territory. Plus, a look at so-called pandemic pods, the parents choosing to forgo the classroom and bubble up with select families to teach their children. We're back in two minutes. You're watching CTV News Channel. Welcome back to COVID and the classroom with education falling under provincial responsibility is shaping up to be a patchwork of different rules and regulations across the country. When it comes to masks, some provinces like Ontario, Manitoba, Nova Scotia mandating them for older students, grades four and up, while encouraging them for younger students. Others like PEI, Alberta, British Columbia, New Brunswick and Quebec mandating them for older students in common areas, but they won't have to wear them all day at their desks. And when when it comes to online versus in-school learning, again, we see different approaches. Most provinces opting for full-time learning in class for all students. Manitoba, Ontario, and New Brunswick all opting for classroom learning for students grades kindergarten to grade eight, with high school students learning partly in class and partly online. To give us their perspective on all of this now, three teachers join me now. Linda Kwan is an English teacher in Vancouver. Christine Buchler is a high school art teacher in London, Ontario. And Deborah Buchanan Walford teaches adult students as well as in Ontario. Thank, thank you all three of you for joining me today. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you for having us. Linda, let's start with you first. How are you feeling about this start of the school year? Are you ready? Uh, mixed bag. I am very excited, mm. uh, a bit anxious, and I've been chatting with my colleagues uh, the past few weeks about their feelings as well. Um, some of them are downright scared. Mm. Um, I, I personally feel excited and a little bit anxious. And yeah. Um, yeah. Deborah, how about you? 
Yeah, I can echo Linda's sentiments. Um, it's a mixture of trepidation, but also I'm happy to have new students again and, you know, get back to teaching. But there's still a lot of unknown, so mm -hmm. that's kind of a bit where the anxiety comes from. And Christine, you teach high school students, you, uh, you teach art. What is going through your mind right now? Uh, pretty much the same thing as the other two. Uh, just really unsure of what the classroom is going to look like and what my day is going to look like. Um, just, you know, a little bit of anxiety, mm -hmm. excitement. I, I miss my students. I've been teaching at my school for 21 years and I just miss them, but I'm nervous about what my day is going to look like because it is completely different from what I've been doing for 29 years. Yeah, for, for, for so long. And now you've yeah. really had to sort of, as we're saying, think outside the box, literally, in terms of what that's going to look like. Christine, your perspective, your thoughts on the back to school plan that your province is outlining, how do you feel about it? Um, you know, I, I just, I feel like it was, uh, just too late. Um, mm. We didn't get information. We still don't have information about um, how things were supposed to happen. Um, I mean, I literally just got my schedule on Friday. Um, I still don't know what my timetable and my daily uh, is a daily timetable is going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, we weren't involved as teachers, and um, that made it difficult. But now we have to figure out how to make it work in our classroom. And I just don't feel like we were given up time. Deborah, what are your thoughts? I know you teach adults. Yeah, so the adults I teach are in the high school system. So a lot of what is said for, you know, students in high school is the same for us, which is not really the best, seeing mm -hmm. that they are adults and they have, you know, different needs for flexibility and so on. And I know that the board and administrators have been working very, very hard. But um, as Christine said, you know, we're, it's a bit late and there's still a lot we don't know. As, as similar to her, I still don't know what I'm gonna be teaching. Um, I don't know how many students I'm gonna have. Right. There's, a, there's a lot we don't know right now. And Linda, you out of there in uh, Vancouver, what is your take on the government's plan there? Um, our back to school plan is a hybrid mm -hmm. of face-to-face uh, -face and also remote. So this reduces our class size to a uh, maximum of 15. And uh, for instance, my English 11, my first course will be split in the morning and the afternoon. Mm -hmm. I just recently got my plan as well, my timetable on Friday. And so I'm still trying to digest it and see how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a bit overwhelming. And I, I'm afraid to, to put too much effort into planning without first seeing my students and how many actually show up right. and, and what it's going to look like. And it's interesting when you talk about class sizes there, Linda, and you're talking about that number 15. Well, I know that in, and in many cases in other areas across the country, Ontario and Quebec, a little more specifically, even Alberta, they would want those class sizes to be at least that, you know, or, or smaller. Um, so what changes, at least in your case, Linda, are you now making, I guess, to that classroom to make it adjust so that it does meet the proper safety precautions for COVID-19? What have you had to do? Well, when I was in, in June, um, when we welcomed the students back, uh, it was optional to come back. So I only ever saw at maximum four students in my classroom. So I really don't know what it's going to look like. I just know mm. I have big grade 11 boys. Yeah. I have white caps too. They bring backpacks. They're not using their lockers. Right. So where are they going to put that stuff? Um, for my room, I'm in a new school. Um, my classroom is not that small. But even with them physically distanced, the, all the desks physically distanced, I could only fit 12 in there. Okay. And I was kind of like having to stand close to, the, to my wow. whiteboard. Um, I'm worried about just the congestion of the bodies and, and the bags and, and all that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Deborah, what are your thoughts here? You've got adults uh, in high school there. And, and again, with all those unknowns, how do you think it's going to, what have you had to now figure out to what you're going to have to adjust in the classroom in terms of learning and teaching? 
So for our schools, we're going to have students um, in a similar split model where they're going to come only certain days of the week Mm -hmm. and do the other portions online. So that's going to be, you know, a bit of a challenge to coordinate, again, with adults who have work and kids and and other things to juggle to make sure that, you know, we do the best for them, for them to get the curriculum the same way Mm -hmm. in as best as possible. Again, it's all up in the air right now. Um, the other piece, as was being mentioned before, with just with space, there's mm-hmm. no more cafeteria, there's no more anywhere to have a break, they're not allowed to eat in the building. And again, we have people who have all kinds of conditions, you know, so we, we're going to have to accommodate them too. So it's a lot of like juggling physical space yeah. as well as the online realm. Uh, Christine, you, as we mentioned, you teaching art. Linda talked about her classroom size is looking to be relatively small in the 15 range. Mm-hmm. What are you anticipating you're going to have in your class and how are you going to be able to teach art? What are you, what are you yeah. going to try and re-navigate? Well, I, uh, my situation is a little bit different. I teach in a rural high school that's uh, over 150 years old with four additions on it. So every part of the school is different. My particular part of the school does not have air conditioning. Um, I have a very tiny classroom that at best, when I'm four at a table has, can accommodate 21 kids. Mm -hmm. I have 24 um, in my current classroom. So my principal has been wonderful, my principal and vice principal, at trying to figure out how we're going to make this work in a school that doesn't have air conditioning, has very small rooms. Um, so we've actually been moving furniture, taking furniture out of uh, classrooms. Mm-hmm. I'm actually not going to be teaching in my art room. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be utilizing two classrooms where I will have my supplies in one room and my classroom which uh, is going to be the the fashion room, right. which is ne- next door to mine. And uh, so I'll be going back and forth between those yeah. two rooms to uh, try to accommodate the social distancing. But social distancing is very difficult right. in our school. Yeah, so, a lot of juggling I can see for, for all of yeah. you. But, I mean, it's a conversation we need to be having. We need to be yeah. hearing about Linda Kwan, Christine Buchler, and Deborah Buchanan Walford. It's been wonderful speaking with all three of you. I wish all of you good luck and, and appreciate all of the hard work that you've been doing. Thank you, Thank you so very much, Angie. You're welcome. Well, after the break, it's the parents' turn to weigh in. We all need life to start to resume. But I am a little scared that kids are kids and they don't understand rules all the time. One of the top concerns and considerations for parents sending their kids back to class, that conversation when we return. In solidarity for all the parents out there that have to live this situation, uh, I think there's an inconsistent uh, application of the government measures right now in the school. Plus, later we'll introduce you to one Quebec father taking matters into his own hands when it comes to tracking outbreaks at schools. to send your child to school with a runny nose or a bit of a cough. I mean, it's scary times, really. Um, It's a lot of close contact between the students, and I mean, they're going to do the best they can. We're excited to come back and excited to see our friends. Well, parents are certainly facing difficult choices this fall. Do you send your kids back to school full-time, choosing online learning? What works for some families may not work for others. To take a closer look at this, I want to bring in two parents. Emily Bozanich is a mother of a kindergartner. Joining me from Coquitlam, British Columbia. And Tina Chapman is a mother with a special needs child. Joining me from La Chute, Quebec. Welcome, both of you. Hi, Andy. So let's uh, start uh, with, give us a sense, Emily. Let's start with you first of how your child is feeling about going back to school and... In fact, are you planning on sending them back? Well, we actually had a conversation with our kindergartner and said that uh, she's not going back to school right now okay. uh, or starting school right now. Um, and we were intending to uh, remove her from her registration for this year and start again in September next year, going straight into grade one, which um, we're allowed to do here in BC. 
uh, but we've been pleasantly surprised by our school that uh, they've actually offered us a gradual transition. Mm. So we've been able to keep her spot. And while we're not looking at, return, at entering the school system at this point, we now have the flexibility to maintain her spot and return when we feel comfortable, which will not be until we're predicting, at least until uh, after Christmas. And until after Christmas. Okay, and Tina, what about yourself? Uh, I, from the beginning of August, I knew I was going to be keeping my son home mm -hmm. just because of the way the pandemic is going. And I spoke with him and he, he told me he was very afraid to go back to school because he didn't want to get myself or my parents sick and then risk being separated from either one of us. Yeah, it's a difficult thing when you hear your child say that, eh, Tina? They're, they're getting a sense of how, diff, how serious this is, but they don't want to hurt anybody. What, tell me a little bit more about that conversation that you had with him about that and sort of what he's been feeling during all of this. I'm very honest with my son. I don't shelter him from anything that's happening in the world because mm -hmm. when we're in these kind of situations, he needs to be able to understand what's going on mm -hmm. to be able to know how to keep himself safe during these times. So every day he asks me, is the virus gone yet? Well, can we go to Africa? Can we go to London? He has mm -hmm. a list of places he wants to travel to, but he knows that if he was to go to school and bring the virus home, if I got sick, he would then have to leave home mm -hmm. and go stay with my parents, but that would be a risk. So yeah. He would really have nowhere to go. He's such a special uh, little boy there that you have. Uh, uh, Emily, yes. what, um, what are you uh, feeling? What have you been able to talk to your uh, little girl about in terms of explaining to her that she's not going to be going back to school? Um, and what is it that you're going to then be doing with her during this time, I guess, at least between now and, and Christmas? Well, she's very aware that um, we call it there's the bug going around, mm -hmm. um, trying to keep it at a five five-year-old level, um, and she's very aware that it's there. She knows that we need to give people space. If we're anywhere where we're indoors with other people, we all wear masks, and she's very comfortable with that. And that actually influenced our decision about not sending her back because she would be in an environment where other people weren't wearing masks. Mm -hmm. um, and there are plenty of children that don't know about keeping space. And that really causes her a lot of stress. So that was a big consideration for us was putting her in a situation where she might understand the rules, but there are plenty of children who may not mm -hmm. because it's kindergarten, you know, people are learning at different levels. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had that conversation of, well, if we stay home, we we're getting a work pack from the school now, which we weren't expecting to get. Our okay. school district has offered this gradual transition where from the school district, we get a work pack. Uh, she's in registered in French immersion. So we have a twice weekly Zoom class with a French tutor. Okay. So she's getting that exposure to French. And we're still doing uh, play dates within our bubble. Um, so we have lots of activities that we're doing outside and that we're including other children from our social bubble in. So she's still getting some social interaction. Mm -hmm. and still enjoying her time, just in a less stressful environment. Because, I mean, the kids understand what's going on, at least to their level. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy for them to get overstressed and over emotional about all of this yeah. because there are so many concerns. Yeah, no, you're right. There absolutely are. And they're probably seeing, you know, what you're going through and, and, what, and the, just a little on the concern on your face. Uh, Tina, what, have, what are you going to be doing then with your son during this period of time where he's not going to be in school? But of course, he does want to keep learning. Uh, we were one of the, the lucky few families to get that medical exemption that we're Quebec requires for distance learning. Mm -hmm. um, it was not easy to get it by any means. And they are supposed to start on September 14th. So I'm still in the dark of how that's going to go. We're supposed to find out this coming week of how it will go. I'm not sure if it's going to be a teacher that is from his school that knows him, that knows his history, mm -hmm. who has access to his IEP or knows what he needs to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so in the meantime, I've been accessing a website that his previous year's teacher gave me access to to print out worksheets for him that we do writing and math and geography and science. And we've been doing that um, twice a day, five days a week until he starts on the 14th. And from there, I, I'm really not sure how it's going to go at this point. We're yeah. still 
very much in the dark, much like the teachers are in the dark. Yeah, taking it one day at a time in hopes that we can sort of get through it together and make sure that our kids are still benefiting from the education. It's been great chatting with both of you on this, such an important conversation. Emily Bozenich and Tina Chapman, thank you, thank you both. We wish you both good luck as you uh, enter this new chapter. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. You're welcome. Coming up, the struggle for First Nations communities to reopen schools safely. We are among the most vulnerable populations in Canada right now. They say they need more funding from the federal government to make sure students don't fall through the cracks. We'll have more on this when we come back. Stay with us. We're also investing $112 million in schools in First Nation communities. This money will help those communities safely open their schools with proper supports for students, parents and educators. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau last month announced funding specifically for schools and First Nations communities on top of the $2 billion allocated to the provinces for the safe restart of school. But that $112 million is a far cry from what many say is needed. Longstanding issues like access to broadband internet make remote learning incredibly difficult. And without funds needed to implement proper safety measures, some First Nations schools are already pushing back start dates, even at risk of closing their doors indefinitely. I'm now joined by Derek Fox, Deputy Grand Chief of Nishabi Aski Nation, which represents 49 First Nations communities across northern Ontario. Chief Fox, appreciate you giving us your time here. Yes, thank you. That announcement you heard just there, that clip there from the Prime Minister, $112 million. Is that enough? It is not enough. We uh, we submitted um, a proposal of $33 million for 49 First Nations, which uh, outlined the needs for our children. And the needs for our children are that of, of uh, PPE, sanitization uh, supplies, but, but also support, things like mental health support, nurses, uh, additional teachers, um, a lot of HR and educational needs that are um, uh, much needed in the remote north of our, our, our territory. Give me a sense, uh, Chief Fox, of what the mental health like is for the teachers and the students, many of which wanted to get back into the classroom. It's been a very long six months, but how critical is it for them to get back into school? It's extremely critical, and as many of our, our uh, the, the, the the people across the country know, our our territory has been uh, plagued with uh, you know youth loss and crisis and suicides, and uh, you know we have 32 remote First Nations, you know that's a, a no road access. So um, the uh, the fact that they've had to self isolate and 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 they've done a good job of doing so mm -hmm. uh, puts um, um, a, a, a greater burden on the on on their mental health and they're, they're anxious to get back to school, get back with their friends, just like many of our students in, 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 in Thunder Bay or Toronto or Winnipeg. So the fact that uh, they haven't been given any kind of support uh, from the federal government is, is extremely hurtful to them and, the, and, and, and the teachers to um, open their school safely. What about the option of virtual learning? Is that an option? We know that broadband has been a very, very uh, difficult uh, thing to get access to if the schools have to close. Is that an option for them, virtual learning? Well, two points to that. Well, um, our students do not learn very well with uh, virtual learning like many students, uh, First Nations or non-First Nations, but the fact that we don't have broadband, um, a lot of it relies on satellite connection and, and the bandwidth in many of our communities do not support uh, that amount of uh, um, online learning uh, or internet access. So, for example, we have uh, four to 500 people in some of our communities and many people are on the internet, just like you'd see in Thunder Bay or Toronto or, 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 or wherever, but we don't have the same bandwidth we don't have broadband so the fact that they can access that kind of education is just not even there and not an option we'll keep a close eye on developments but I, this conversation is certainly a very important and critical one uh derek fox deputy grand chief of nishabi aski nation uh really appreciate you giving us your time today we wish all the students out there good luck yes thank you still ahead how students feel all about this a lot more self-guided in terms of learning, and that was a little bit more difficult for me personally. I also have a feeling that school is going to shut down again in the winter, so I'm also prepared for doing all my stuff back at home. 
We'll get their take on in-class learning versus the virtual option when we come back. You're watching CTV News Channel. some perspective now from students themselves on how they're feeling during all of this. Aidan D'Souza joins me now. He's a Seneca College student in Toronto. We're also joined by Brenda Cheslin. He is a the chair of Canadian Alliance of Student Association from Halifax. Great to have you both on the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Aidan, let's start with you first. Your thoughts about getting back into the classroom during a pandemic. Yeah, so for us at Seneca, it's going to be, um, for some programs, completely online. Mm -hmm. So a mix of like pre-recorded audio lectures or live video conferencing. Um, I find that is a much safer option right now during the pandemic. Um, but also the social aspect of it as well. Um, all of our events like frosh orientation um, for new students and current students all moved online as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely excited to get back to the new school year this year, even if it is virtual. Even if it's virtual. Bryn, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, we have members, uh, you know, that are going to be heading into this semester uh, that are dealing with fully online classes, some that are looking at hybrid structures, uh, and even some where they're coming back to campus entirely. So I think the thing that I'm thinking a lot about right now is that students are facing a tremendous amount of uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, I think, for this semester. And, you know, there are a number of plans in place. Uh, but COVID-19 is changing our world each and every day. So I think it's uh, definitely a difficult time to be a student and thinking about where we're going to be, you know, three months from now and not just next week. And Bryn, what about those? those students that are getting into university or college for the first time now. That experience is unlike anyone's ever experienced before. How do you think that's going to affect them going into that school year? And hopefully eventually they'll be in the classroom. But what about that first crucial year? Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And, you know, we're being told by a number of institutions, uh, you know, that they're viewing this as kind of a, a blip in a degree or, you know, there'll be a slight delay and, and, and then students will be able to be back in the classroom, you know, to complete, uh, you know, the final three or four years uh, of their degrees. And so in that regard, uh, I think for students, there definitely is a little bit of concern or, or questioning about, you know, how am I still going to make friends? How am I going to be able to connect with my classmates? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, it's important to say that uh, a number of student associations and institutions have I've been working hard on trying to answer those questions over the summer, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out this fall. Aiden, do you think this pandemic could potentially impact students' academic careers? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think for some students that have more hands-on programs than like colleges, mm -hmm. it may affect their graduation date by a bit. But I know colleges and universities are working hard to try to keep the graduation dates like on time. Mm -hmm. I completed the summer program at, uh, in college in the summer. And Seneca did a great job in helping me get my credentials fast, quick, and easy. So I think um, with hard work, students can graduate on time and it won't affect their academic um, careers at all. So then what would your advice, Aiden, then be to new students? What would your advice be in, I guess, in a time that none of us are, you know, familiar with? Yeah. So one of the things I would recommend for, like, all new students is go to orientation events, even if it is online. It does help you a lot. Um, you learn a lot of new information about the school, how to study online, and you get to meet new people. So there are a lot of events happening at like all post-secondary institutions across the country to help you connect with students, professors, and just keep the student engagement up in the classroom and in your social life. Bryn, what are your thoughts? What would your advice be to new students or even current students that are going back now and feeling already overwhelmed by what they might have to face? Yeah, I think taking opportunities as they come is extremely important. And I actually think, you know, one of the benefits uh, of, uh, or one of the positive implications of moving courses uh, either fully online or to a hybrid delivery is it means that students will be able to connect, you know, across the country. Uh, in some cases, they'll be able to connect internationally as well. So I think actively seeking out opportunities, you know, to set up phone calls or video calls with professors and with classmates is really going to help bridge those connections. And really sort of uh, rethinking on how you're going to handle it all. Aidan D'Souza, Bryn DeCheslin, it's great speaking with both of you. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Silicon crowdsourcing COVID-19, how one father is tracking cases in classrooms across Quebec. That conversation when we return. You're watching CTV News Channel.
Welcome back to COVID and the Classroom. I'm Angie Seth. Some parents are choosing to skip traditional schooling altogether, opting instead to form what they're being called pandemic pods with other families. Small groups of children will be homeschooled together either by a parent or private tutor. Here to explain is Rachel Marmer. She's the parent of four children and also the founder of Learning Pods Canada. Great to uh, speak with you today. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Good to be back. Hi. Thanks for having me. So explain to us again, just a, a more of so in a nutshell or from in your terms, what uh, these pods are and how exactly they would work. Sure. Well, they're really a reaction to a problem that a lot of parents are facing right now um, with COVID-19 and what I would probably call inadequate back to school plans. Um, so I think what you're seeing is a reaction to parents who are just feeling like they need alternative options. Mm -hmm. um, learning pods are really, they can be arranged in a myriad of ways. Um, so there's not really a one size fits all way to run a learning pod. It's mm -hmm. really customized learning. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. I that's, that's it helpful. in a nutshell. And you start a Facebook group basically about this. What's the reaction response been so far? What have you been hearing from other parents? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think that everybody's feeling like our leaders have failed us and the reaction from the leadership right now has been inadequate for our children and back to school. Um, so I think that, you know, what you're seeing is just a gut reaction from a lot of families and teachers as well. Um, feeling like they're not being prioritized or taken care of in an adequate way uh, for back to school. Um, you know, 100 people are not allowed in a building right now, more than 100 people, and yet we're throwing our kids to schools of 300 people or more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's just a lot of problems, and I think this is a reaction to that. What is the plan then, or I guess your plan in this case with regards to your kids, in terms of how long you're going to, you're looking to maintain the pod? At some point, would you be looking at bringing, having them go back to school? Like, what, what is that point at that point where you're going to decide to say, it's, I feel it's safe and we can now go to that, go, to, go back to the traditional learning of in class? That's really not up to me. That's up to our leaders. That's up to a, like a whole host of people beyond my control. Mm -hmm. I think um, it'll take a lot to, for parents to feel like we're in a place that we can go back. And the new normal is a phrase that's touted a lot. So I think maybe this will be part of that new normal. We've adapted in the way we go to work and we've adapted in a lot of ways. And maybe in the ways we educate our children, we need to start adapting as well. Um, so maybe maybe things don't go back to the way they were because, you know, we're being we're being hoisted into a new normal. So mm -hmm. this might be just part of that schema, and um, this might fit in, you know, very well into what we're looking at with the new way things are. Right. All right. Well, we'll keep a close eye on that. And certainly, again, parents doing what they can to keep their kids educated. Rachel Marmer, it's great chatting with you. Thank you very much for this. Thank you so much. Always love it. You're welcome. You. Let's take you over to Quebec now, where it remains unclear how transparent the government will be when it comes to making COVID-19 cases in schools public. But one Montreal father is stepping up to the plate, creating a website to keep track of cases. Oliver Durin is joining me now. Great to have you on the program. This, we've, we've had a lot of talk with regards to what it is that you're doing here and trying to track cases. You've got two daughters, I understand, ages 13 and 15. Talk to me first about your concerns about them going back to school. Uh, I guess it's a universal concern as a parent. Uh, when I saw the back-to-school plan from our Minister Robert here in Quebec, uh, I was uh, worried. Uh, there was a few things missing that, that uh, some other provinces that I've heard on your program are doing better than Quebec. For example, uh, online class is optional or social distancing mm -hmm. or mask in class, uh, proper ventilation. So these things are, are not there. So when I saw that, and I saw that outside of Montreal during the May period, there was a back to school uh, and there was no data around the COVID cases, I wanted to do something about it. So mm -hmm. I decided to put this site together. You put the site together and I understand you've had quite uh, the traction on that site with the number of people uh, checking out the numbers. What have you been able to find so far compared to what the government's been, uh, been putting public? 
Uh, that's correct. I've had over 800,000 page views on the site, and uh, I have 84 schools that have been confirmed as having at least one COVID case, which is quite a lot. And the government came out with on Friday night around 5 p.m. with a list of 46 that they deem to be uh, the same as I'm reporting. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge discrepancy. A huge discrepancy. How are your kids feeling about all of this? That conversation you're having with them is... I'm, on, I'm going on the assumption, are you having to send them back to school? Yes, I am, and it's quite positive. I'm not sending my stress on the kids. The mm. kids, I have a positive experience. They actually uh, enjoy getting back with their friends. Uh, they actually wear their mask in class, so they're quite aware of the risk, and it doesn't take away from their experience. Uh, even though it's in an imperfect uh, back-to-school plan, they still, they still are kids, and they're enjoying school. And how long are you planning on maintaining uh, the website now again as, as, as you continue to track those numbers? Uh, as long as the government uh, will not step up and uh, make all the data available, uh, accessible in real time so that everybody has the right information to make informed decision and understand the risk in their community. Are you hoping, Oliver, I've got a few seconds left here, that the government's going to hear, hear your calls on this? They have, and they made a very first a good step in the right direction Friday night, mm -hmm. and I hope that they continue to do that in the future. All right. Well, we appreciate you giving us your time. We wish your kids well on their uh, back-to-school plans. Oliver Drouin is a father who created a website to track schools with cases of COVID-19. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, we hope we've answered some of your questions, addressed some of your concerns whether you're a parent, teacher, or student. And we certainly have a lot more information and resources to offer you on our website, ctvnews.ca. I want to wish all the parents and kids out there right across Canada a safe back to school. I'm Angie Seth. Thanks so much for watching. Good night.